Welcome to 100 Tips and Tricks. My name is Patricia Rollinson and today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you 100 novel ways to do different things um, using tools, um, paints in different ways, different ways to use your brushes, that kind of thing. They're listed on a separate sheet so that you can look to see which um, tool and where it is in the video and um, so you can kind of navigate that way. My first tip is going to be um, how to use stencils and um, achieve drop shadow. So what I'm going to do, this works really well, you can use it with leaves too. What I like to do is I like to go ahead and mark a couple of my lines on my stencil so that I have a good understanding. The tool that I'm using to mark is called a triple threat ghostwriter and it's actually a ceramic lead so this will come off of your painting by just, it'll come off with varnish actually. So you can erase it when you're done with the lines or whatever. But once I've achieved where I can see um, where my lines are, then I'm going to drop this evenly down and I'll apply my drop shadow color. I'm going to use some French gray. Your drop shadow color would be just something that would be slightly darker than, um, than your background. In this case, um, French gray is a good color for our white and I'll dry it all off on my paper towel because you don't want your um, drop shadow to be super strong. Okay, and so then what you can do is just go ahead and give it its pounce. And I'll go ahead and do this off camera because you don't need to be watching me do that. Something else that you can also do is you can do a little scumble action when you're trying to do a soft color. I forgot about this, so I'm sitting there pounding and this is way faster. Much, much faster. No, be careful about holding your stencil down though. You don't want it go sliding all over the place. By scumbling, um, it speeds it up and it also diffuses and it gets rid of some of that stencily texture. So see how much faster that goes. Okay, so I've got that color on and then I'll go ahead and make some heritage brick letters. So what I'll do is I'll then put my stencil right where it belongs on all of its lines. not going to be painting with my drop thread. Okay, and then I am not on my lines at all. Nope. Yeah, I get it straight one way and then I mess it up the other. Okay, and then we'll just paint as usual. Okay, and you can see that we have a perfectly awesome little drop shadow right there and you can do this with any of your word stencils and it makes for really quick signs. Okay, this is a tip from Jolene Hessman. Um, we take the tips um, as we go through the years and um, make sure that we give credit where um, when people share them. So this is an airtight peel-off palette and it is a wonderful boon for people that take classes or seminars because you know how you always have the paints and you don't want to buy them all. So you can put your paints in all the dividers, you can put a piece of wet sponge here, you can blend on all of the sides of this. So you can use this as a palette. You can spritz it, wipe it right back off. But after a little bit of time, like, you know, you use it and you're mixing paints and stuff, you might get some scratches and things like that. And it might not help it be as non-stick as it used to be. So when that happens, what you can do is you can just rub and condition it with just a little bit of vegetable oil, buff it out, and you'll be non-stick again. So that's a really good way to extend the life. And when you, when you um, are purchasing these, um, wait for sales and then get a couple of them because this, you could pop this in the refrigerator, um, make sure you do have a little, squirt them before you um, put them in the fridge, and then your palette will stay fresh until you're ready to continue your project. And then this is also unique from airtight palettes or from stay wet palettes because this has actually got that rubber gasket and it locks down on all four sides so that it stays sealed. So um, this is highly superior to most of the palettes out there. Okay, my next tip is to use short, bright brushes for very controlled um, floats. What happens is these longer, this is a curved flat, and then this is just a regular um, flat brush. When you use these really long tapered um, brushes, then they, they tend to splay out a little bit more when you're pushing down to float. They tend to be just bulkier somehow. I'm not quite sure how that works. But when you use the short brights, you don't have to use very much water. Okay, and so I'll show you. What I would do is a normal float. Oh, 
me do a normal amount of water. Just blot on my paper towel. And then you can see I'm going to get that like carrying over. Okay, and so a normal float is going to be just this kind of beautiful graduated color. But sometimes you need your colors to be really, really tiny. You know, you got just, you know what I'm talking about. So what I would do with that is I would take out almost all of the water and I would just a tiny corner load. It, this brush is so precise and it's a little bit thinner um, as far as its thickness this way. And then you have that really, really tiny little float that allows you, if I had quite enough water, if you need to have a little bit of extra water on your palette, squirt it on your wax palette and then you can pick up just a microscopic amount of water. I'll run that one more time. Got a little excessively dry. So see how much more control you can do. So when you really, really need your control, just make sure you extra blot and get the right kind of flat. So you can get into really tight little spots. Okay, this is a studio water basin, and this is just hands down, far and above, um, the, the little square ones that we all kind of cut our teeth on. Get out just a little bit. This one is my extra spare one. But um, this it's empty so I can show you. And I've got dried paint and crap in the bottom. You could clean it out. But um, what's neat about this is it's got a good sturdy handle. And this is like never fallen off. Um, I've had it overloaded and just all kinds of things. It's got this third well that you could load with Easy Float or with your brush cleaner. The brush cleaner and restorer doesn't um, affect it, then you can actually get your hand in here to wring out stuff, so your sea sponges and things like that, it's accessible. And then you have two completely distinct compartments with a big enough divider or tall enough divider that you don't have to worry about sloshing paint from one side to the other. Some of those other ones are really low and you don't get any water in there. So I tend to load my clean water from the front and then rinse and rub on those little things um, and then I tend to rest in the back where my dirty brushes go. So if I'm going to reuse the brush, I'm cleaning it here, drying it out, reloading here, but then if I'm not ready to wash it, I just dump it in the back. I think one of my favorite parts about this um, brush basin is that it has these little um, grooves right here on the handle. And so what I do, like your liner brushes and your flat brushes are going to work way better if you pre-soak them and let them sit for a minute. Water molecules are attracted to water molecules, which means that um, that your brush is going to attract its water and paint better if it's actually pre-wet. So you definitely always want to pre-soak your brushes for floating and for lining. Okay, we had a tip to use um, rollers, the foam rollers, for making a hand support for your brushes. Sometimes the skinny brushes, when you have to do a lot of detail work, are a lot of work to hold on to. Um, so what you can do is just take one of your um, base coat sponges and you can just stab the brush straight on in there, cut it, cut off a piece, mold, you could cut and trim and do whatever you want. But then see how much wider my grip is on here versus here. So I'm not as tight, I'm being able to stretch my hand out and it's cushy. So I could do my base coating, I could do my stroke work, that kind of stuff, all with just my little pre-made um, little sponge helper. Okay, the brush cleaner and restorer is brilliant at keeping brushes clean. However, when you dump out the, the medium from here, it tends to kind of splash and do messy things. When you empty one of your two ounce bottles or one of your other products, and I can't even open that puppy, um, I'll pick on French gray blue here. When you get rid of this, go ahead and wash these and save them for bottles like this that could use just a little bit more if I had it on there. I don't want to get the blue paint all over that lid, um, so that you can squirt it out with a lot more control. Okay, so that's a really good tip for um, managing um, this medium. Oh, and that tip was from Pat Kennison. We often borrow tools from other industries. Um, we paint a lot of rock lawn, and one of the easiest ways to cut your rock lawn and to make sure you're really squared up is to use your self-healing mat and your um, rotary cutter. Okay, so in the right on along and it's going to be straight and wonderful. Use your rulers and things like that as well. Um, the, um, when you're going to micro cut the rock lawn, then you'll use a retractable blade and your self-healing mat. 
and then you can do all of your little cutouts and not be damaging your table. Okay, there's going to be a couple of different suggestions that I have for using your smartphone. Um, we've come a long way with smartphones and most of us either have a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. This little guy right over here is a little elephant icon and this is Evernote. Evernote is a really amazing and powerful, it's got a huge cult following all over the world. When you open your Evernote, um, it's got, you can make any kind of notes that you want to in here. Okay, I've got baked stuffed grape leaves and a link to a website. Um, I do a lot of recipes. Go back. All of your notes, you can just click to add a new note. But what's really incredible is what you can do is you can use your camera. Let me get a thing to take a picture of. So say this is a magazine article and you want to take a picture of it to remind yourself. Okay, so we're going to take a picture of the project and then if I had a magazine article laying around here, hang on a second. Okay, so here's a magazine that it was in Paintworks Christmas 2011. It's actually one of my projects. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and it's got this wonderful poinsettia and maybe I'm thinking, well, you know, it's February or January or you know, March, and I want I want to paint this, but I don't think I want to paint it right now. I just got done with Christmas. I want to wait a little bit. Okay, so I've got my my camera. I can take a picture of the project. I can take a picture of the instructions in the supply list. Okay, so I'll get that up there, and I can take a picture of the cover. Okay, and what's neat about Evernote is all of this text that's in your photo is searchable in Evernote. So if you handwrite a note that says call call Miss Mary about borrowing her brushes. Um, what if you search in Evernote Miss Mary, then it's going to find that note. And so what you can do is you can put all three pictures in there. You can look up um, Paintworks and it will find Paintworks because it's in this photo. You can look up Winter, you could look up Poinsettia, you could look up Patricia Rawlinson, as long as you've got a picture of that. Um, and it would bring up all of the projects that you wanted to paint by Patricia Rawlinson. Um, or you could look up Raphael Kalinske, any of the supply lists as well. So there's um, many, many, many different ways. And what's really cool is the way that you get it into Evernote. You can be in Evernote and take pictures, but you can also, I was in the right place, I'm just as slow at my technology. You can just email it to yourself at your Evernote email account and it'll email it right on in there and then you can go back and add more keywords and things if you want but because it reads the text in your photo it makes it already keyworded if that makes sense. And then you can say okay I know I want to paint that this 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 you know and it gives you a way to archive your magazine so you can put them away and not have them out on your desk waiting for when you're going to paint. All right, this technique was supposed to be called use your respirator when you paint, but I can't find my respirator right now. So instead we'll talk about this um, brush drying rack. So this is, it's really easy to put together. Um, it has a tray down here for drips and it has sizes of um, rubberized grip areas that are perfect for even the thinnest paint brushes. So you can put your big fat paint brushes in here in the ooh, little tight. Ah, here I am. Okay, so it's got like your large, your medium, your small, um, and then you can figure out how to hang all the brushes. The best thing about this is like this is a $35 or $40 paintbrush. If you've got some nice brushes that you've spent more than five or six bucks on, then you always want to dry them with the head down so that the, the water doesn't run back up in the ferrule. And um, if it runs back up in the ferrule, then um, it can mess up the, the connection and stuff and it can make the, the brush head tunnel and things. So you want to dry them head down and so this is a great way to achieve that. I've never seen one that actually will hold the skinny brushes too. So this is a wonderful um, advancement. And that's called the Stay New, um, the Stay New brush holder. Like Stay is in S T A. Um, it's actually spelled S T A. All right, this tip was from Jess Sisson, and this is um, you find the perfect stencil, but it's too close to your other stencils for you to use a brush well. This is not the most perfect example, but 
you can simply tape to mask out any areas around a stencil that you want to isolate and then your stencil will be, um, you can use it without having to take too much care but it's a really great way if you have a really busy stencil you can mask the different areas remove the tape and you have a, a perfectly good whole stencil again. Okay, these gloves are called nitrile gloves and they are chemical free wonderful gloves. They they won't, the fingertips won't fall off when you use stain and stuff like that. They're not chemical free, they're chemical um, resistant. Um, but they are tremendously wonderful. Any kind of glove would work for this, but um, the nitrile gloves are cheap, affordable, non-latex, and all the chemicals don't bug them. So I like these gloves um, just a lot. So it, when you have sponges, like this is a mushroom sponge, and they're wonderful for base coating and stuff, but sponges get a lot of paint in them, and you've got to really work that out. So you've got your running water, you know, going over there. You just put on the nitrile glove, and you know, if you've got phthalo blue paint in here, you're going to get stained, and it's going to get in your fingernails. And if you've got a manicure, then that's all wrecked. Um, so this is a great way to prevent that. So you just would squeeze that, you know, underneath the water until it runs clear. Then you can rinse and wash off your glove, remove it, use it again the next time. Um, these are super duper awesome gloves, and they make sponge cleanup much easier. This is a little bit of glass painting all at one time, so it's more than one, te uh, one technique. But so what you can do is you can put your wine glasses and whatever in your craft lathe, okay? And that's going to make it really easy to keep your hands off of the painting, okay? And then you can use the flexible see-through ruler for measuring, and you can measure your line here down from the edge, and then mark it with the china markers. They're like a waxy kind of marker that marks on glass, and they're made for china and glass marking. Okay, they wipe off with your paper towel. Um, I imagine that rubbing alcohol would also wipe them off, but I'm not sure about that. And then this is my wonky roll of stretchy tape, but stretchy tape is amazing stuff because you can tape even on areas that are um, um, where they concave in and stuff. Sorry, my words left me there. So you can actually take it and pull stretchy tape and tape in circles. So this is a valuable tool for glass painting because a lot of glass is not straight up and down. Okay, so you can use your ruler for marking, then your markers for actually writing on the glass, and your craft lathe for keeping your hands out. Um, and then this is an accessory kit for this. It is, you, you have to provide your own um, bar cloth. This is rubberized um, bartender's cloth and you can, it, the metal disc is what we sell and it's got a centering hole so that um, that you can center it on your lathe and then you can put open mouth container things on there. Okay, this next tip is the same way. You can take terracotta pots that will fit on the craft lathe and you can use it on the craft lathe for painting on. But one of my favorite techniques that isn't really talked about too much is how to seal this terracotta pot so that you don't end up with your painting. If you water this pot and it's a porous pot, the water is going to come through, it's going to seep under your paint, it's going to kind of chip the paint off. You don't want that. So what you do is you take cork sealer, which is designed specifically to, um, to prep cork that's being used for duck carving, which they're going to submerge into water. So this is truly a waterproof product that is amazing. And you can put it on the inside and outside of your terracotta pot, continue on with your patio paints or whatever paints you're going to use, um, seal it, and then you are good to go and you're not going to have chipping paint and your work will be preserved. Okay, this is a one-two combo. This is an artist buddy, which has the nonstick bartender's uh, mat on that does come with this, and the um, craft lathe. And the artist buddy, has a little um, kickstand down here so that you can put it down flat and you can put it up high. And the neat thing about this is, is sometimes, and then you can also spin it. Okay, so that lets you turn, if you're painting something round, it lets you um, just rotate it to the right angle. Sometimes you need to have the, not sometimes, all the time you need to have the right angle for painting. Okay, and then that can sit on there. And what's neat about this is I can get my hand a place to rest and then I can be painting my stroke work, turning, painting my stroke work, and turning. It's all about having that control and having that place to rest. If I'm way down on ground level, that's not going to allow me to get a good position and eye, eyesight line to my project. So super good way of giving yourself another area to paint.
or a, an angle to paint. Okay, this is our triple threat Ghost Rider, and we've talked about that um, a little bit. It has three colors of leads. It has white ceramic, gray ceramic, and it has a roller ball with um, a rolling head. One thing we haven't talked about is the fact that there are extra leads that you could put in this, so it does, changes it from white and gray. Maybe you do a lot of work on um, another color and you want blue or green or pink or yellow. We have all those colors, and there's replacement leads. So I'm going to show you how to replace the lead. So um, this turns by just turning the shaft, and it tells you what thing is there. It also has an eraser on the other end. But if you need to um, change the lead, what you're going to do is you're going to evict the current lead by just pushing it down, and then you can just pull that lead out. Okay. Then you're going to unscrew it from here, which I never even knew it unscrewed from there. And then you can remove your, um, your piece from the little hole that it goes into, and then you can put the new lead in the back side. And so that's how easy that is. And if you get stuck, let us know and we'll walk you through it again. Okay, my next tip is a talking tip. Okay, so we have our floor cloth, okay, and we know that those edges can curl, and that is a problem. If you have a um, ceramic tile floor or something, you can use double stick tape to tape the corners and keep that down. If you don't have a ceramic floor, then you can use the, um, the bar cloth, put it underneath, cut it to size, and put it underneath your floor cloth, and that'll help rubberize um, that. If you have not, if you can't use that option, then what you can do is you can actually hem it, but you'll want to hem it before you paint it. Hem it with a postal corner, and then you will, um, it'll stay much flatter than if you have just the unhemmed edges. Okay, this is a four inch wide, and look how huge it is to my hand. Four inch wide um, brush that is good for um, image transfer and collage. You can apply your medium really thin. And because these bristles are short, um, watch this. Here's a brush that um, I got from another manufacturer. These bend and they do this kind of little weird thing. And once they're bending and pushing, then what's happening is you're building up ridges on either side and that's not, that's not desirable. But when you're using this brush, it doesn't really do the same thing and you can keep it flatter. It's got much stiffer um, control. And what's really neat is you can do fantastic base coats with this and get your whole thing covered in no time. Okay, this is a little two-headed hand drill and it has a skinny side and a slightly bigger side. And when you need to have that ornament hole and you don't want to go out to the garage or do any of that, you just get it started and then you just drill it by hand and then you'll end up with sawdust and all that kind of stuff and it is super duper 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 handy I cannot tell you how many times I've used this classes and all that kind of stuff and you can even make yourself a little starting hole for your nail heads we already talked about our brush basin but the combination of our brush cleaner and our brush basin just pour some brush um, cleaner in here now be careful the one thing about this this is um, non-hazardous, biodegradable, low vapor, all those wonderful things. It's not going to hurt you, but it does like to eat plastic. This plastic, however, is made out of a plastic that it doesn't care about, and it's stored in plastic, so it's just certain kinds. I know for a fact it eats styrofoam plates, so don't clean your brushes on a styrofoam plate. But you can pour it in here and it won't hurt it at all. You can wash this down your sink, it's not going to hurt your pipes. Um, so that's a good way to have your brush cleaner on board so that you can clean and rinse and put your brushes away. This is the sizing dial, and how many times have you had a surface or a project or something like that that has um, needed to be resized? Um, and that is um, one of, the, like, a big pet complaint. This will resize items from, let's see, from one inch all the way up to 90 inches, okay? So, and it, it, the new size is bigger and much easier to read, so it's easier to manipulate. It's simple if you um, read the directions. I always, I had a problem with this for like two years. So this one is the size of the original, okay? And then the, this is your reproduction size. So whatever you want it to be is the outer ring. Whatever it is currently is this. So you take just one of your dimensions. For example, um, say we want to resize this art called the remote control. So we'll take the dimensions and we'll say it's four inches. Okay, just for ease of, so the size of the original. I'm going to find my 4 inch, and maybe I want it to be an 8 inch remote. So I'm going to dial it around, looks like it had gone backwards, to 8 inches, 
and I'm going to line up the 8 and the 4, or the 8 and the 4, and right where these two lines come together, it tells me that I'm going to need to increase by 200%. So you go to your copy machine, you lay down your project or whatever, and you increase to 200%. And it works the same way to reduce. So for example, if we have a 20 inch item, and we want to make it into, let's see, this is the size of my original. So we have a 20 inch original, and we want to make it into a 10 inch. Okay, so we'll line those two numbers. This is my original. This is where I want it to be. You are going to reduce it by 50%. Okay, so it's super easy to use. Just got to read the, the little signs on the thing. It makes it easier. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, talk about is embellishments. We have got embellishments like crazy, and I think embellishments as a tool really increase the loveliness of the art. So this is a cute little ornament. And I could have easily just a little hook and whatever. But by adding curly wire and little jingle bells, um, we really elevate it from just a cute craft to a thing that you might even buy in a store. Okay, and we've got all the gamut. We've got things like crystals to hang off of your ornaments that are just gorgeous and reflect light and all that. Jingle bells, wire. We've got key fobs. Um, We've got brass accessories, we've got wood accessories, we've got Moonlight, which is one of my favorite new things. Um, we've got these in gold and in silver, and they are bright. And what's really neat about them is they are wire, so they hold their shape. So you can actually make them into a much shorter strand. You could put these in your glass bottles. The battery pack is a miracle because it actually has a timer. It's got an 8-inch timer. You just flip that little guy over to the middle, and 8 hours from now, these will turn off. At Christmas time, I put a set of these in my nativity. Um, I've got like one of those 3D nativity things. Um, and this battery pack lasted for three weeks of it going on. So it lasted from December 1st all the way until Christmas and it didn't die, so I was able to do it for a whole month. And during your darker times of year, it's nice to have a little light in your, your craft settings and stuff. Okay, any artist would not be complete without their sketchbook, and this is a really unique sketchbook. If you Google it, you will find it is a fabulous trend. It is just a miracle thing. Um, Jess Sisson has a site called Rogue Crusades, and she um, sells the, the little printouts, but this has got a little um, rubber band kind of thing that holds everything together and then what it is is it is a series of separate little sketchbooks so you might have this one is um, a date planner okay and then you might have uh, this one okay so date planner you've got notes where you can draw and sketch and then you can replace the individual ones you've got a contact one there's just a billion different kinds of things They've got them where your checkbook fits inside, you can put stamps, um, there's all kinds of things. And the way they work is they just slide out. This one's a new one and so it's not as flexible. You gotta kinda wear them, break them in, not wear them in, but break them in. And so this just slides in and out. Oh my it. And it's just a little sketchbook, if you will. And then when you fill this one up and you need a new one, you can just slide in a new one and then you can keep going so that your contacts stay in there the whole time. When it's a new year, you don't have to start a new sketchbook. And then the more you use this, the more worn its cover gets, the more traveled it looks. Um, people have accessorized these with all manner of things. It is, it's a beautiful art form just all on itself, but a really handy kind of sketchbook to have. Okay, in the printout sheet for this video, there is um, a supply list of things to take when you're going to a class. There's some really oddball things that you should take that you won't think about. Um, an extension cord is one of the best, and make sure it's long enough to reach from the middle of an aisle over to a far wall so that you can have your blow dryer or your hot glue gun or embossing gun or whatever types of things, your light. Um, you just don't think about what kind of things you need to take, so I've, I've included a list that um, I've come up with. Um, things like chalk pencil, if you have one of these in with your brushes, then um, the, uh, you can make it into a piece of uh, graphite paper easily by just rubbing a pencil and a chalk pencil on there. Um, a sharpening device for your pencil and ch chalk pencil, just weird things. Make sure you have an extra pair of glasses. Um, if you can't see your project, you're not going to be able to paint it. 
So um, take a look at that supply list. It's really important that you come well supplied so that you don't have any stress and worry when you're learning how to paint um, with a new teacher. Uh, one more thing that I like to do is I like to create a little travel kit that fits inside like a Ziploc bag, like a gallon size Ziploc bag. This is a water basin that's collapsible. Um, you can paint on it if you want to. Um, you can get little 5 by 7 um, palette papers. You take just a piece of your tracing paper, um, fold it up and that kind of thing, paper towels folded. Um, you can put your most important brushes and then that fits just really easily into your travel supplies if you're going on a cruise, going someplace else. Um, then it gives you the ability to take your hobby along with you. Okay, my next tip is about your thumb. Okay, so you've got your thumb here and you're holding your paintbrush. There are two ways that I've seen students over the years paint with um, using their thumb. And I think it's just a matter of physiology. Um, and it's not something that they're, you know, just not doing right. It must be somehow that's how their thumb goes. But there are two ways. There is making it like this where you're clutching it at the, at the um, joint. Or there is clutching it at the tip. And what I've seen is when you're doing your lining especially, um, you're doing this, you get a better range of motion if you're clip, clutching it at the tip than you do if you're clutching it here. It's much more stiff. Do you see how I can't really rotate that around very well? Whereas if I'm here, I can be like, yeah, all over the place and doing all kinds of things. So take a look at your thumb and if it's smiling at you then and your knuckle is out, then you know that you've got that good flexible position. And if it's not smiling at you, then you might try turning your frown upside down and testing that out and seeing if you can work on making that comfortable because you're going to have a lot better lining and a lot better control over your paint. I think last year was the year of the magnet for us. We used magnets for just about everything. This is a little wooden pin and it has a triple bar magnet with um, a bar across the back that holds onto your clothing so that you can um, put your pin on without piercing your clothing. Don't use this if you have a heart um, pacemaker thing. So what you do with these is you can put them, um, say you want to put like a little snowflake on this guy right here. You would glue this to your little snowflake and then you put the magnet on the back and then you have a piece that will stay and won't shake off and all that kind of stuff. It's a much nicer way of attaching things than um, gluing them down and having them be permanent. So this is a good temporary way to attach things um, when there's not an, a metal issue to worry about. Oh, and the way that you get these magnets apart, because these are super strong, is you slide them. And don't stack up a whole bunch of them in a row because they get stronger the more that there are there. And don't get them too close together without holding onto them firmly because they tend to snap together and they will kind of bite you. So you want to slide them, hang onto them firmly, and then slide them together. Okay, so this technique is all about the airtight palette again. If you put water in your misting bottle and you're spraying your paints, make sure that you're using distilled water because it doesn't have any of those um, bacterial type things in them where regular tap water might have all kinds of stuff in it. It's just going to be a more pure water. And then to prevent a mold and things like that, you just put a little penny inside your palette and that will prevent the mold. I don't know what copper does to that. I don't know why it works, but it definitely is a tip that most um, season traveling um, teachers and students use. For really big, big surfaces like floor cloths and things like that, sometimes you might need a bigger floating device. Um, I've got a Tuscan Grapes floor cloth where I had big shading. I mean, it was like a foot wide. And that's hard to control with a one inch brush. So what you can do is you can dampen a kitchen sponge and you can put it as far across as you need to. And then you blend just like you would anything else. You can blend on some wax paper or some freezer paper if you need to. And then make sure that your brushes, or your brush, well, anything's a brush, is um, wet enough to do the floating. And then you can come over here, and this is paper so it's absorbing. But the, because this part is wet, it pre-wets and it actually makes a really good floating tool. And you can just coax it out. If you were on a piece of paint or something like that, it would be working much better. But you can see that it definitely floats out. And so this is an awesome little paintbrush in a pinch. We already talked about cork sealer and um, earlier for terracotta pots, but sometimes we don't think about things like coasters. So we've got our coaster here and we've got patio paint, cork sealer, and a coaster.
What's neat about this is you can take your quirk sealer, seal all the edges. This is designed to be submerged in water, so this is going to be a waterproof piece. And then your patio paint is designed to resist water being on top of it. So then it's going to resist any water sitting on the top. And that is a great way to make a coaster or anything that is going to be like a tabletop or something um, into a waterproof um, piece. Now what I had to do with my patio paints when I wanted to paint like, um, I, I'll actually here I'll show you, I wanted to paint my purple grapes into a coaster set. Okay, so I had done this project already and I had used stencils to do this, which was a wonderful technique. But I wanted to do them on with the patio paints, but I had used the regular deco art paint. What I did was I converted those paints, and this brings us into our next tip, and I'll be right back with that. Okay, the next technique that I want to show you, I'm just going to change to a new palette sheet. By the way, an extra tip is make sure you use the gray palette paper because it's toned and it will help you with your painting so much. And if you're painting like white roses or something, you can actually see where you're blending and if you've got a good blend going. All right, so I've got patio paints and not all of them are completely shook up. So you can also store your paints upside down um, to make them stay mixed better and all the good stuff will be at the ends. So let's talk about palette knives. When you're mixing your paints, you want to have an offset palette knife, meaning that there's this arm. Because if I ran, let's see, a say a paintbrush, and I'm going to use it, it's flat. I can easily run into my other piles of paint. So this way, I can sneak up and in and over. And I like these metal ones because they are super duper flexible, and I can really go to get a good mixing action. Every now and again, take the time to clean them because um, you can see that I have got a buildup of paint over mine that has made it into quite a big monster. <laughs> and I could use my um, paint cleaner and restorer and just soak it in a little bit of that and this would come right off. I just haven't done it yet. Okay, so our blue wasn't quite mixed up. You can see that it's got all that runny gunk there. The proper way to mix paint, number one, um, is to mix your dark into your light. So I'm going to mix this into two piles of paint here. Okay, so if I put my light into my dark colors, then what's going to happen is I'm going to end up needing to add a lot, a lot, a lot of white or cream to it because the dark is a much stronger pigment. So by just sneaking a little bit of my main color into that, I don't end up with a mountain of colors. Okay, so what I did when I was trying to match that palette is I used what we call a mother color. Okay, the mother color in this case was Daisy Cream. Okay, so I, I went in with my colors, and if I needed to lighten anything, I did it with Daisy Cream. And so you can see that these two are not any kind of family members at all. But by putting a mother color, which is basically giving the paint its DNA of another color, then you can make two paints that aren't related into brothers and sisters. And that is an excellent technique to take, ooh, that's a lot of purple, um, to any class or any type event that you're doing. If you want it to, go, to get along, just mix it with a common denominator and it will be perfect. So now you can see that while they're still purple and blue, they are definitely family members. Okay, so that is how you get everybody to get along. I've been doing a lot with stencils lately and it's been um, really interesting to see how to organize them. One of the neatest things that we've discovered is this little um, their little scrapbook page put her together thingies. I think we call them, pay, uh, I don't know what we call them. They're in the stencil category. Anyway, but we've taken to putting holes in the corners of all of our stencils, including just in all of them. We're going backwards and doing it actually. So, um, we can, whoops, if you can aim for the hole. All right, we'll get in there. And then you can put that through there, and then you just screw that post together. And so this, what I like about this is it puts like with like. Like I'm probably not going to use my fall um, leaf stencils in Christmas time, and I probably wouldn't use my grapes with my snowflakes. Um, you know, there's like some things that just go together. So this way I can organize them. I could put all my word stencils together. Um, if I have a lot of welcome words, I could put all my welcome words together. 
depending on how much you paint and how much you use stencils, that will depend on how you organize them. If you only have, you know, 20 stencils or something like that, you might just want to put them all together so that you have all your stencils on a little wheel. You can take them apart or leave them together, doesn't matter. But a really handy way to store them or organize them. My next tip is these um, protect and store um, boxes that are super affordable from the scrapbook world. Okay, so they come with a lid and they fit down in there really nicely. You can do a number of things for decorative painting with this. You can store your stencils in there. If they bend just a little bit, it doesn't matter. This is my Halloween box, and I have many more Halloween stencils, but for for this purpose right now, I wanted to show. You could fit just a ton of stencils in there. You can flop them over. Um, stencils that have tack it over and over on the back don't seem to hurt each other when you peel them apart. At least ours don't because they're made out of this really extra nice mylar. Okay, so you can use them like that. But say you have um, some coasters that you're painting. Okay, you can put your surface in there, your book your mediums, your paints, your brushes, everything, whatever you're using that's specific to that, and you can seal that up and then have all your supplies ready. Cart this to your class, um, cart it out to the dining room table. It comes, puts back in here really nicely. So it can be like a portable little art studio. Okay, the rage right now is all about chalk painting and chalk um, lettering. Mixing our chalk with our paints is really cool. You can paint right on top of your project. Um, you can do your lettering with chalk as well by just outlining and then scribbling in. Take the new ink paint chalk brushes and they've got pointy ones that you wet to clean up your edge so your lettering is not done until you say it's done. Um, a couple of really good ones. This is a phenomenal um, little sponge applicator and it's great for smudging. Okay, then this little guy right here, it's got a flat top and it's real stiff and it's great for diff diffusing and kind of blending things together. And then these guys are soft and they make a real dreamy effect um, when you're doing it. So there's some really great brushes um, in the ink paint chalk line that make it really easy to do. If you're wanting to make things look like chalk, which is what I love, um, I love the idea of using these colors, but I love, love the idea of using chalk color because I love everything chalkboard. Then you would just do that on a, whoops, on a painted surface. I can't do it on that white paper. Okay, and it just goes right on top. Okay, then you blend it and you get it how you want it. And you use a workable fixative, um, which has to be shipped via truck, so make sure you choose the correct shipping, but um, the uh, that makes it so that you can come back in with your paints and keep working with it um, even though you're done and it sets the chalk and you don't need much I'll tell you. Um, you just mist it gently and it sets the chalk in and then you can go back and keep painting and put roses on top or whatever you're going to do. Alright, we've got some people that might be holdouts or might not want to mess with chalk at all but might want that look of chalk. And I've done some projects myself that have um, chalk. Oh, another good tip is when you have stubborn bottles, use a pop top to open them. That is a wonderful way to open the bottles of paint. So you might, hmm, that's icky. Okay, you might want to go ahead and um, Make it look like chalk, but it might you might want it to be actually paint. Okay, so we're going to mix our dark into our light. And I'm just going to mix that down just a little because chalk has an appearance of gray because it's got black behind it. Um, so that's going to make it just appear a little bit like it's um, it's been chalked on. Get myself organized here, I promise. Okay, so I'll go over here and I'll do these oars here on this floor's word. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that dry rubbing technique and we're going to dry it all off. Okay, and then to give it that blendy, blendy, fuzzy kind of look of chalk, we're going to make sure that we do that scumble thing that we talked about earlier. Okay, and that's a light, 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 light look. Okay, and I'm going to go up above just a little bit. I don't think I had much paint on my brush at all. 
Okay. So that, see how that looks like it's a little bit fuzzy like chalk and all that kind of stuff. So then you can do that fuzziness and then you can go back through and you can decorate and stuff like that with your liner brush. Okay, so one tap tip that I love is that your eraser, when it's used dry, will not erase um, your paint or whatever. Okay, so I'll go over here and it, it just doesn't erase. But when I dip it into water and my paint has been applied in the last five minutes, then it will erase my paint. So if your paint is fairly fresh and you use a little water, then it actually will remove that paint for you. But it won't touch it if it's wet or if it's dry. So this is a great technique. And this works with most of the white erasers. So um, I've got like this, um, the little squared micro eraser, um, the round micro eraser, all the tri-tip ones and all those. Works the same with most of the white ones. Okay, you're more than likely going to want to do chipped paint at some point. So what you can do to make chipped paint is I've used Clapham's Salable Wax, I've used Vaseline, and you can use chapstick. So you just run it along the edge or whatever. So you put your base paint down, then you use your wax medium wherever you want, and it's a really good idea to make it splotchy. And then you put a heavier coat of paint on top and then when it's dry, you just scrape it back and let it chip how it's going to chip and then it will remove it and you'll have a beautiful chap chipped old finish. Okay, we're back to some glass tips here. Um, so when you tape on glass, our first instinct is with tape is to go ahead and remove it instantly so that it doesn't grab the paint and take it off. But what I found is that you want to remove the tape after it's been drying for about 24 hours um, and make sure it's really cured and then you can take it off. Uh, make sure you're pulling towards yourself, but it's counterintuitive to the way that you think it should be. You want to actually let it cure. Okay, more than likely if you're watching this video, you are doing it on a computer or a tablet or something like that. Um, if you are watching videos for painting or your favorite videos or YouTubes or whatever how-to tutorials on your cell phone, then you're definitely going to want a device to hold your phone up at a good viewing angle because this certainly doesn't work and leaning them doesn't work. And if you lay them on your table and you spill, then you've got a paint, um, a painted phone. So we've got this keep calm and paint on everything pattern that we've done. And we've got some roses and some different, a whole bunch of different things are coming out. This just slides right on in there and it's got a place for you to plug your phone in and for the, the cord to come out. And it's got a good angle. Then you can take it off and you can turn that puppy around and paint on the back for holidays or whatever, or just change things up. You could decoupage grandkids' faces on there. There's a lot of things that you could do with the phone. And we've also got a tablet stand as well. It makes such a difference for your workstation if it's something that you interact with a lot. Okay, this Ultimate 3-in-1 color tool is a really cool freaking tool. Um, you might not think you're going to love it, but you're going to learn that you're going to love it. Okay, it has a lot of information about color theory and how to use the tool and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's great. But when you get over here to the actual colors, it gives you your color families and stuff, and you can, so that way you can kind of isolate and get into the thing, into the, the right place. But if you've got, you know, this blue-gray color, um, and you come over here, what it shows, I'll go back into maybe describing a little bit, um, what it shows is it shows your pure color, and then your pure color plus white, and then your pure color plus dark, and then your pure color plus grays. So you have um, just all of the colors that you can do with this pure color. And we've got um, a PDF that actually um, goes through and talks about what these colors are in the deco art line. Okay, but then on the back, it goes on. And what's neat about this too is double-sided. Okay, and you've got, so here's your tone, which is with the grays, and you know, you've got the whole gamut, every color possible. Um, well, probably not true, but, but they give you all the information in the CMYK, and they give you the RGB as well, and they give you whatever the one is for the, the RGBs, one of them's website anyway, so if you are having websites made, you can reference the color from this color chip. Okay, but they also have on the back side of it, the red and green value finder. Let me show you how that works. So I'm going to project over here. Well, actually, you know, I think these snowflakes would be 
be a little bit better. So red does the um, red does cool and green does warm. Okay, so if you look through here, you can see your highlights and your colors. Okay, and so here you can see see how you can see different bits better. Okay, maybe I said that opposite just a little while ago. You can see if you've got good shading or not good shading, and actually I think my grapes might be a better example. Okay, so you can see your lights and your darks without the color getting in the way. Okay, so this is going to show you are my highlights high enough or are my shadows dark enough. Okay, so that's a really great tool to use when you don't know. And if you paint by yourself, it's probably a really a, a good thing to add to your repertoire so that you can say, hey self, am I bright enough? Am I dark enough? Because contrast is where the beauty is in painting. Okay, I watched a whole video on how to start these kinds of pens. This is a gold leafing pen. You want to shake your paint your pen from side to side gently, okay? And after you shake it for a number of minutes, instead of pumping really strong and hard over and over and over again, you're supposed to just pump real slowly. And you'll see the color coming down. Otherwise, you flood the tip and then you make everything into a great big giant mess. Okay, so I'm almost there. There we go. Now what's neat about using a marker like this instead of using gold leaf is this has, you know, adhesive and it has sponges and it has buffing and it has all these things. If you need just a little bit of gold drop shadow or you need some gold banding or something, tape your edge, use your pen, you're done. This is a lot more intensive. It's much better. You would never do this on a frame, but this is a really good answer for when you just need that kiss of gold or copper or whatever metallic color and you want the ease of a pen. Okay, you've used up your press and seal and you've um, done all the things that you can with it and it's all gone. Save the box because the 12 inch tracing paper on a roll fits in there. And you can just tear that off and now you've got perfectly straight tears. And say you want, you know, you don't need this piece right over here, you can actually just store that right in there with that. So it's a great way to store and keep your tracing paper all in one piece and not unrolling and stuff. Okay, so you want to paint a tiny little clock for a cute little gift or something like that. This tiny little clock is a CD. We sell little adapters that go on the inside. You would paint your CD with, um, in this case, what I did is I used texture paste on it and made it into a texture. Um, but you could put paint adhesion medium on it um, after you glue this on and then paint like usual. We have five inch size clock um, faces so you could actually make a really pretty, this was before we had the clock trim and all that stuff, but you could do a really nice um, clock numbering and lettering with the stencil. And then you can paint as usual, seal it. We've got little hands as well, so you can make a cheap, free little gift um, out of a thing that we would throw away. All right, you're in the middle of painting and you suddenly realize that maybe your texture paste is wet or you've just done your gold trim or whatever and you need to get your hands out of things. So this is an acrylic bridge and I love that it's see-through so you're never, your vision isn't ever being blocked. You can know exactly where you are on the piece. Um, and it holds it up about, about an inch off your project. So it can go over, I don't know if you've ever tried painting a tray that um, has raised edges or whatever, it can go over the edges of that so that you don't end up with your arm, you know, doing a weird wonky thing. It also gives you an immense amount of control because when I'm here, I can only plunge up and down just like maybe about an inch. So by coming here, I have two inches of lowering down and I don't have to have as much control to achieve a beautiful um, stroke work or line work when I have my arm on a bridge. And if you've ever painted with um, extended wet mediums like oil paints or things like that, um, or watercolor paper where you can mess up the paper, you know that it's a good idea not to have your hand leaning and resting on your project all the time. So, um, and this gets you out of it where you can blend and gives you plenty of breathing time to dry things. Okay, this is an Ikea bin. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's something Swedish. Okay, and if you're painting a project and you have, you know, 20 paints that go to that project, and you have a situation where either you need them collected or, you know, they're cluttering up your table, use a bin to pull your paints in instead of having them just freestanding around, and then you won't knock them over. They'll be easy to gather and set aside, 
and um, just a much more desirable effect um, to keep them gathered together. You can put them upside down in the bin and then they won't fall over so that you don't have to shake as much. Um, it's a really, really nice technique. So like you've got your red here upside down so that it's good stuff is draining towards the tip. Okay, back to the Stay Wet palette again, only because it's got these wonderful little cubbies here that paint can go in. And then if you wanted some medium, like if you wanted some drying time extender, you can reach in, grab it, and put just a little dab into each of your things with a lot of control and precision. You can use um, these little pipettes to do that or, you know, drip and drain in. But this has got the control where you can go drop, 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 and you have even application. I want to show you how to do super duper controlled spattering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix my paint with a lot of water so it's nice and inky effect. I'm always going to tap off over here. Okay, just to get the excess falling. If I want it to look like snow, I'm going to be above my surface and I'm just going to tap evenly and it's going to fall all over like snow. But say I want to spatter in an area like this, but not all over everywhere else. And maybe I want to spatter in an area like that, like the end of a leaf. I like to do that a lot. Okay. What I'll do for this long kind of spattering is I'm going to go ahead and turn my brush on its side. Okay, then I'm going to anchor it with a heavy handed thing to, to pounce against. And then I'm going to aim it in the direction I want it to go. Okay, if I want my spatters to, to land right here, I'm going to, the, the wider I want my spatters, the higher up I'm going to be, the closer and tighter I want them, the lower I'm going to be. And I'll put my brush right behind so that they're going to pounce forward and then most of my spatters are right exactly where I want them in within that little circle so that's how you can get really um, concentrated spatters super controlled spatters oh and I use the white wonder rake because it just seems to have the right length and all the stuff okay if you want a good way to carry your brushes to class this is the um, telescoping brush um, carrier. You want to push that guy down there with a pencil or whatever will reach. Okay, just get that all down at the bottom. Okay, and then that will stop the brushes and give them a nice soft landing place. Then you can put this on there. If you've got longer brushes, you can keep it long. If you've got shorter brushes, shorter, and then you can go down to your normal size. So just a really nice handy way to keep maybe your best brushes Maybe you would want to keep your liner brushes in these so that they're all together in your brush basin or in your brush um, holder. If you want to make a really nice chalk paper, the other day I had something that was too tiny to trace. For whatever reason, transfer paper doesn't transfer very easily with tiny details. And I'm not sure why, but you can make, just using your chalk pencil, and rotate it for sharpening purposes. A wonderful, and you can Wipe that off just a little bit, and then you tr turn it over. And let's find that something to paint on. And then you can trace whatever your design is. And it comes off with spit and water because it's chalk. So it's super removable, super easy. Okay, so I've got my, um, this is a laser level. And this is also from Ikea. I think it was like $7.99 or something. It's really cheap. So what's neat about this is it comes with all your different bubbles. So you've got your um, vertical, horizontal, and your diagonal ones. And then you've got this ability, if I can, yeah, to give yourself a laser, a level line. So when you're happy with where your bubbles are at, that's your level laser line. Super portable, super handy. If you do any kind of writing on walls, hanging pictures, um, you know, just all that stuff. This is a super doozy thing to have. You want you want one of these. Okay, I'm going to show you how to use this mister. So this is a a mist it mister, and it's like a almost like a little um, airbrush. It mists so fine. Get it primed. Okay, look at how wonderful that is. Okay, so now what you can do is you can use it with stencils or with screens. We're going to call this wood piece a screen. I'm going to go up high. Oops, you gotta, you gotta give it firm pressure. And some, as with all things, you want to give yourself a little bit of practice area when you're learning a new technique. 
so I can lift that out and then that's what a screen does okay and then if you needed to clean up any of your stuff now I'm on paper once again so that's going to be um, a little bit awkward but q-tips come in this little handy jar they're super sharp and super dense um, little guys and so what they can do though is they can soak up stuff now if I wasn't on paper that would soak up and remove okay so if you get a blob where you don't want it then you can just go in with your q-tip and you can also clean up and you can do a little bit of kind of floating and color manipulating with these as well they're that firm okay and when you're ready to store your mist it you want to dump out your paint what I did is I filled it to here with water and then I just put a little bit of paint in there um, and then you can just rinse it out and then spray it till it's clean and you're good to go okay so I'm going to talk to you about taking pictures you can take it with your regular camera you can cut things out of magazines um, you can do whatever you want but you can this one is actually a photograph I took a picture of all these beautiful butterflies because I love the patterns and everything and then there's um, pastel butterflies and jewel butterflies and all this kind of stuff if you keep a folder for things that you know you'd like to paint like maybe you want to do stepping stones with butterflies you wouldn't want them all the same color but you might need some inspiration to show you you can do it this way and have a file cabinet or you can go the non-paper route and this is an app called Photo Manager Pro and this is my conventions um, folders for all the different kinds of conventions that I go to and stuff like that so I can go to my Hoot 2013 and I can go and see all of my um, wonderful pictures um, of people and students and you know all that kind of stuff there's trouble right there but um, so you can work it the same way that you do it with um, paper folders but you can make project folders this way you can also do that same thing on Evernote so you can create little folders um, there and then you can you know send the pictures into it and have that digital file it's a really great way of taking your inspiration with you do make sure you always back up your phone though with Evernote you don't need to back up your phone because Evernote is a cloud-based thing and what's neat about Evernote, and I don't get any commission from Evernote, but you can access the same files on your computer, your tablet, and your um, phone, and they're updated instantly. And so, like, for example, um, I took a recipe for some Brussels sprouts to a gathering, and um, everybody went crazy over them. Oh, my God, I have to have the recipe. I was able just to sit right there and just shoot them all an email right from Evernote because that's where I store my recipes. Okay, so I'm going to want one more phone tip. Okay, so this goes into no, wanting to know if you've got enough shading and highlighting. So I'm going to take my picture with my phone. I'll click on my photo. Okay, and then there's an edit button, and everybody's phones are going to be a little different. I can click on this color thing right here, and I can switch it to grayscale. Okay, so now I can look and see, do I think that I'm defined enough? And frankly, yes, I think I really, really am. So this allows me to see if I still have, if you take the color away and you still have the structure, then that means you've got good contrast. So by taking the color away, I'm not distracted by it anymore. And I can see that I still do have good contrast and that it's still an interesting and pleasing thing even in gray. That means it's probably good to go. And actually that's not all. Um, so you've got your picture say you're going to paint this um, project that you have um, purchased from my website and I say shade with whatever okay which is a common thing let me go ahead and save that and make it a done thing but maybe you're looking at it and you see so much whimsy and so much this and so much that that you can't isolate where I've shaded and where I've highlighted so with this it's easy when you change it into grayscale to see where the highlights are and to isolate without color to see this is obviously where she shaded and then I can definitely see there's a highlight there and there you know you can see all my little C strokes and stuff like that so this is a really great way to get your super up close detail so you can take a picture of my picture or you know whatever and then you can get super up close and see all the nitty gritty details Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about collage and, and image transfer papers. Deco Art Americana Matte Decoupage Medium is the one that I love the best. I've used other ones and not they don't like to release or hold things down as well. 
um, the the Mod Podge line, um, in my opinion, the ones that I've used, and I'm, they're making so many of them now. I'm sure they've changed some formulas, but um, when I'm using collage with them, water tends to reawaken it, so I can't paint on top of it. Deco arts you can paint on top of, and it doesn't reawaken. Okay, so that's that's a really nice um, feature. Okay, so. Image transfer is where you're going to put your medium on and you're going to put your image down. You could never in a zillion years paint all this detail. So I've used that and what I love about it is I've used it in the background here and you would have a hard time telling that it was the same thing because just the ink, wherever the ink is, is what's stuck to my background and then I've shaded and antiqued. But it adds such interesting there's little words back there, there's Eiffel here, there's, you know, Fleur de Lis over here. It just adds such a subtle, beautiful depth and dimension that I think it's worth um, exploring. Okay, so I really do adore them. And then we go into something like this collage paper here. We've got it pre-distressed and we've got it on a cool background. Just going to glue that down and then you can paint your scene on it. Um, the reason why you would want to use a collage paper is because if you bought this stencil, it would be thirty or forty dollars. It's just too much, um, too much money, frankly. Um, so to to build this all up with all your stencils. Now, on the other hand, if you have a lot of stencils that you've already used, um, then you can piece together your own piece. That's fine. But then also getting this really nice faded look that you can do so easily with the computer um, is just a wonderful thing to have already done for you. So um, this is a a work saver and it is wonderful when you've got these just this really um, awesome patterns or busy backgrounds. Alright, I want to talk to you about choco paper. There's white choco paper and there's blue um, choco paper. And I don't know if you can really see it. I've done a little blue smiley face on the back of my um, pop top. And what's neat about choco paper, I've just licked my finger, is it erases with water. So regular transfer paper erases with an eraser, and sometimes it doesn't erase very good if they have too much wax in them and stuff like that. But the choco paper will erase and not be on your piece, just like the ceramic lead does. Um, so it's a really great thing to have when you don't want all your detail lines to show. You've got to be careful that you don't put it on before you're going to float, because then you'll float away all your lines. You've got to just think about that when you're um, doing it when you're painting your piece. Okay, let's talk about mopping for a second. Mopping is a, an art that I don't think people understand so much. I'm going to use a little of this phthalo green color. Ooh, float away on happy notes here. And then I'm going to apply it to my ornament. And I've got a little bit of a ridge line. So what I want to do is I want to mop right on that ridge line, right where the clean area is, and then work my way back. And that's going to blend my colors together. I can wipe it on my paper towel, and that's going to be great. But if I wanted to maybe make a pretty background or something like that, okay, so maybe we've got some, some gray, and then I want to mix some of this color in to that, I might want to go in with a bigger mop to blend and mop that together. Okay, so mops are your friends and you need to understand when to use them and how to use them so that you have that ability to reach out and bring in something that's going to save your floats. Um, and then every now and again give your mop a little scrub so you don't end up with little hard tips on the ends. You wipe it on the paper towel while you're using it. I bet you're wondering why I have a thing of tuna. Okay, so the, the wonderful thing about um, things in hermetically sealed pouches is that you can easily slip this or the ones with the crackers and the little manis and stuff like that or a Snickers bar or something like that make sure you always have one of these in with your painting tools because you just don't want to be hungry when you're trying to learn that fantastic technique that somebody's showing you or whatever you want to have your stamina make sure you bring good quality nuts dried apples tunas things like that um, we all think we're superhuman but we all know we're not when we get hungry and um, so make sure you do pack um, some sustenance in with your painting gear. Okay, I've got these wonderful, um, I make these little rectangle double-sided bean bag holders and they are just filled. I fill them pretty full so they're still flexible. They're just filled with cheap pinto beans. Okay, and I fill them up 
I stitch the end tight and then what we do with these is we put them one bag always lives in our freezer and one bag always lives in a, near the microwave and so when you're painting and your neck is getting stiff because you've been hunched over or whatever um, that kind of thing it's a good thing to have something like this um, a gel ice pack or anything like that so you can heat and ice your shoulders and keep yourself from getting all cramped up great for carpal tunnel as well you can heat and cool um, so these are fantastic and they make really awesome gifts. I've got, you know, football flannels and monkey flannels and, you know, nice elegant scrolls and stuff like that. So, um, but in the, the other thing that we use them for at the house is my husband is colder than I am, so he always puts a bean bag in the wintertime in his bed like an like a old bedpan kind of, kind of thing where you heat up the bed with it. And it stays warm almost all the way through the night and keeps his feet warm. So it's, there are wonderful little things to have around. There's some really nice cheater techniques or super shortcut techniques that you can use to paint things like grapes and stuff. So you can take your grapes and you can just take a simple circle stencil that you cut yourself or that you cut from something else. And you can build a bunch of grapes just by plying your grapes one by one. Slightly overlap them. Now I used a five-part stencil for the ones that I did, but um, you could certainly do it this way as well um, if you understand like where the values go and stuff. You can also use a fingertip dauber to apply some grapes, and you can just easily make big bunches of grapes by doing that, and you can get your shape and everything like that. So that's another real fast, cute way to get some grapes. The fingertip daubers also come with a cap so that they'll be dry, or they won't dry on you. I tell a story this last year that I didn't realize how much glitter costs. And so we've come up with some techniques to save you a lot of money and a lot of time. Okay, so there's funnels that you can take your glitter and you can mix colors, which is really kind of an exciting thing. So you take your funnel and you can put a little bit into one of these bottle bottles that have a little bit, I guess I've got to start this one. Okay, so, and then you can put the lid on and you can apply your glitter of course within a glitter tray and you can shoot it exactly exactly where you want it and I didn't put enough glitter in there so you can apply it within the exact space instead of sprinkling it and all that kind of stuff then what you can do is you can take same set glitter um, funnel you take the cap off of here and then you can save all of your tapped off glitter so you can always save your glitter you're not going to make as big a mess. These glitter trays are amazing. Use them for bead projects as well and any kind of project where you have a lot of little stuff. One of the keys to getting from painting to finished and having a nice lovely project, um, which is the idea behind um, showing you all these tips and tricks, is to keep your project intact while you're painting it. I know a lot of people end up with paint smeared on top and stuff because sleeves are hanging. You want to try to address as many of these things without getting too anal about things. Having a towel on your workstation that you change every time you do a new project is a really great way. You can throw it in the, in the washer and reuse it and stuff like that, but that way you can get paint on it, but you'll see where your paint is, if that makes sense. So if I'm painting here and I see a little paint smudge, I know I'm not going to roll over into that. Um, I'm using a paper towel for, the, um, for my fake towel. So then the other thing that you can do if you're two-sided, like we talked, like if I want to paint on the back side of this and I flip it over, it's really easy to run that through something and end up with a dirty side or it's just rubbing on the table and stuff. So that's when you can take your press and seal and you can just press it all over this one side and then trim it kind of small and that will seal that side down so that it doesn't get run through anything and you can safely paint remove the press and seal, and then you've got both sides done without any anything getting damaged. If you cut a piece of non-stick a craft mat or purchase one the size that you need to the size that you need, it makes an awesome um, foundation for your painting on your dining room table or coffee table or someplace like that. Um, I like to make placemats out of these for when I have little classes. I make like um, workstation size placemats and we have painters who just are a little bit um, carefree with their paints. So this way I can wash them off and they roll up really, really well for storage. And then I have an extra mat for everybody um, when I have a table that isn't set up that way. 
I want to take a moment to talk to you about this resin. This is an amazing product. Um, it's a GDO resin, and it's a two-part epoxy kind of deal. You do, um, and somewhere, one of these gets two and one of these gets one. You've got to read the instructions. Um, so, what you're going to do is you're going to use a little cup. Now, they give you these two little measuring cups, but the first time I used mine, I couldn't clean the stuff out. So, I wouldn't use the measuring cups. Um, that they give you, I'd use them for something that you want to keep them for. But what I found is I can use those little McDonald's or Wendy's um, ketchup cups for that. And then just a cheap popsicle stick. You pour your mediums in. What I do, what I tend to do, is you, to get it the two part for one and one part for the other. I'll put a little peanut sized stuff in my cup and then I'll put the two peanut size, you know, the two sizes that are similar and then I'll mix it all together in one cup. Here's an interesting thing. I'll show you a close-up. This is like how to do this and do a better job than I did the first time. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this, but I've got some hazing and cracking right around my edge. I didn't mix it up all the way, okay? But on this one, you'll notice that I have that beautiful enamel wear kind of look. And then I also was able to sprinkle and have some glitter in there as well. Okay, so, and then this just cups right up next to the edge. You just kind of lead it with your stick and get it close to there, and then you put it someplace level. And I found that if you put a piece of nonstick mat, this nonstick mat, truly nothing will stick to it. Okay, and then I did a, this is my little um, paintbrush, um, paint bottle opener that is from forever ago. Um, and so this little guy right here, I have covered in this GDO stuff. And I had sprinkled heavy glitter and all that kind of stuff. And he's he's okay. I did an okay job of it. It was my first one, so whatever. But I wanted to see how waterproof it was. So I soaked this um, for a day in water. And you can see that there is no, like, milking or any of that kind of stuff. So if you want to put, like, bar top finish or anything like that with this product, it is amazing. And what you'll notice, too, I didn't have a single pin I didn't have a blowtorch, I didn't have anything, and I don't have a single bubble in this at all. And let me tell you what the difference is and how I did it. So you've got your cup, and you've got your medium in there. And you, you mix it, and it's going to turn a little bit cloudy, okay? So then you keep mixing it real slowly, not super slowly, um, and it'll get a couple bubbles, but they go away. Um, so you mix it until it becomes clear, okay? And that's the key that I missed the first time. And then... I set it aside while I did this one, and I hadn't quite mixed it all the way. And then I was hoping that I could finish this one and I could get to it be before I throwing this stuff away. The sitting it aside for like five, ten minutes, and then just giving it a couple more mixes and then applying it seemed to give it the most crystal-like finish. So letting it actually cook for a little bit and then applying it, not a super long time, you don't want it to harden, but it does take like overnight to harden, so I think you're probably okay with 10 minutes. But that just made just the world of difference in both. And also on this one, I also handled it too soon with my fingerprints. I didn't let it cure all the way. So big, big difference and really easy to do once you know what these rules are. Okay, this tip is about paper towels. If you'll take your paper towels down to your husband's bandsaw and, or hand them to him and just buzz them right in half. You have a paper towel roll that will fit in your painting bucket without taking up this much space. The other technique is that you can tear them off and store them in um, Ziploc bags and then you'll just have a little flat um, parcel of them. So either way it's a much sa space saving um, technique to bring your paper towels to class. Okay we've all got books by authors that we just really love. I've got a collection of Yvonne Creasel books that I just find just so inspiring for me. Our techniques are a lot the same. I learned from her. She um, lived close to me and I was able to take classes. So what you can do with these books is you can take these to your printer, like um, your Kinko's or whatever, and you can have them make them all connected into one big book um, with a, one of these spiral bound um, things. And they take care of the whole thing for you. And then you'll have you know just one resource. It's a really nice way to bring your collections together. Okay, my next hint is for internet um, access for painting sites. We're going to call it that, but it's for all. 
I've got an app on my phone that I use for my passwords. It's called M Secure. And what you can do with that is you can store all your passwords in there. It logs you out automatically and it will erase all the data if it's attempted more than 10 times. Um, you can email yourself a copy of it or you can send it to a secure place. I send a copy of mine to my Evernote account. But if you don't use a smartphone, you can buy one of the little black books that are a buck. You know, they're not very much. They're address books. And then you can put your painting sites and all your passwords and things like that in alphabetically. Just in those. And we actually do use those at work so that they stay on site and whatever for our different things that we have accounts for. So it's a great way to stay organized and save more time for painting. Okay, we all know that simple is better and um, and that's all fine and dandy. But sometimes you see something like a little iron chicken who's got the cutest little body and shape. You just have to own it because it inspires you, it makes you laugh, and it's just it's good for your soul. I've got two pieces here. This one I think I paid $6 for, which is probably way too much, but I've owned it for 10 years. Um, and then I've got this little box that I found at a garage sale, and it's just got this wonderful bee vignette, and they call them love bugs. How cute is that? You know, and so this is a really darling little piece. I love bees. I love beehives. I love roses. It makes me super happy. I don't use it for anything. It just sits around and charms me. So sometimes you have to surround yourself with things that inspire you. Make sure that you're taking um, taking a strong stance to making your painting area an inspiring area. Okay, if you've got a super big pattern like this, it's 11 by 17, but you only have a printer that prints to this size, which is 8.5 by 11, then what do you do? If, you're, if your file is in PDF format, then what you can do is you can print... Um, it's called printing poster and so you can make a series of this will scale it and make it if you need it to be on four sheets of paper it'll make it on four and that way you can print out your line drawing the way that it needs to be in one size and then just tape your pages together okay I think one of the things that keeps people from painting the most is disorganization in crowded painting rooms um, and so when you're disorganized or your paint table is cluttered with a whole bunch of stuff it makes it really difficult to get in there and feel good about painting. So what you can do is you can take your palette and you can make a project palette and you, know, you squirt your stuff in there right on it with the Sharpie and then you've got your whole entire palette in one of these little baggies and you can put your paints away and you can keep your palette together so that it is always portable, always ready to go and then it will make you easier to paint if it's all packaged in together with where your project is. Okay, these are a tool that we came up with um, that are color wheel um, color isolators. And it's really interesting, there's a thing called um, simultaneous um, contrast. And that is where you put something really light against something really light and it changes what the color looks like. Okay, same thing with dark. You put dark and dark next to each other, it changes what it actually looks like. So it's no good mixing this color red on a gray palette if I'm going to use it on black. It might look completely differently. So what this does is this allows you to spin this around to see and isolate your colors and you could move it down. Okay, so then you can get exactly the color you want. And then they're done so that you can flip them over and you can see the colors on the other side. Okay, super awesome for color management. So we've got them labeled with monochrome, split complementary, triad, tetrad, and analogous, and complementary. So you can see what your palette would look like, you know, and be like, oh, okay, I think I want to paint it like that. And on the back side, we've got a smaller color wheel, and that's sized so that you can use these tools a little bit better. To make painting um, more jazzy and prettier, you can take and make sure that you get your glitter in lots and lots of colors, okay? And then you can do neat, neat, neat things with them. Let's see, let's get a, uh, maybe we'll go gold into copper. Maybe I've got some lettering that I think would be really pretty graduated into these colors. I can put my glitter, my gold glitter on the lower half of the letters or the part that's gold. So I paint the letters, then I do the gold on the gold area, and then I can transition into the copper area so apply my glitters at different times and allow them to dry and then get the other glitter out and do that. 
That is almost like painting with glitter and it's beautiful. A lot of us paint and sell our items. So in order to get really good photographs, you want to get a tripod. They make little ones for your iPhones. But what I've noticed is the older I get and the older people around me get, I've noticed that we get a little bit more shake in our hands and stuff like that. And it's harder to get a really professional picture. So um, get yourself a tripod, put that camera on there and let the camera do its job at its own speed without any of that shaking. Okay, I purchased one of these crazy little blow dryer stands. You just pop your handle in there and bungee cord it around and it's great for blow drying things that are going to take forever. So you just pop that puppy right on in there and it's adjustable. I've made a station over my, um, my um, trash can that I put my cutting mat on and then I put my blow dryer in a wire cup holder. So whatever works for you, get a blow dryer stand because they are amazing. Or rig one up because it just frees your hands up. You can Go look on Facebook and see what other people are doing while you're waiting for things to dry instead of just holding the thing. Okay, you can use your stencils for shading and highlighting. I'll go into this purple color. We'll call that my shadow color. So I can just hold my stencil down and I can put a shadow that fades by just using my stencil as a mask. Really a nice easy technique. I can go back to the edges and I can deepen them. and I can fade it out and smooth it. I can do the same thing on the opposite side with my highlight color, and then you have a shaded, floated with a stencil, but totally doing an easy technique. Great for beginners, great for advanced, great for everybody, kids, awesome. Okay, this tip is about super film. Now we all paint and it all looks good and everything like that, but when you use super film to sand your finished product, you end up with a satiny, 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 wonderful finish that is amazing. The way that you use, you can use super film dry or wet. So it's just a little piece of sandpaper and listen to the difference. Okay, big difference. Already smooth, smooth, smooth. Okay, and I'll get just a little bit of that orange dust, but that's okay. Now it comes in these sets of three sheets, but I always cut them down into these little squares because these are just too big. And it's only really going to do the work where my fingers are and my fingers fit, so I like that. But what you do, if you want to super, super film sand, you wet your surface, you add one drop of dish soap, and then you sand with wet. And you've got to varnish a little bit, so you'll see that I'm getting some color off of that. But when you do this like this, and you've got that little bit of soap to keep the friction at bay, then um, you wipe it off. You will end up with the most amazing finish ever. And you will be in love. And then what you do after that is you put one more coat of varnish and you put some Clapham Salad Bowl Wax over the top and then you have the most amazing finish you'll ever have experienced. Okay, Decorate came out with a line of glass paint markers which are fantastic because you can zentangle with them you can do all these really cool things. Um, but what you can do is if you have, say, like a plate, you are you flip it over to the back side and you've got your pattern taped on. You can take your black liner and you can totally trace your outline on it. Now your project has been lined, okay? And you want to paint on the back of glass because you don't want this glass paint to touch the food. So um, if it's going to touch the food, you want to be on the back side. Then you can base coat all the way to the edges of your black and the black is still going to be showing as your clean liner. And then you can do your other, th well you have to do your highlights first and then you put your base coat on. And now you've reverse painted, but having the marker to do the line work is brilliant with glass paint because it's difficult to line with glass paint. Ultra matte varnish. This is a really interesting phenomenon because we've always had matte varnish, but there's always been just a little bit of sheen with it. Even our paint has a little bit of sheen. The ultra matte varnish has absolutely zero, zero, zero sheen. And what's neat about that is you can go in, if you don't want it shiny, um, then that's obviously a first choice, but you can go in and it, you can continue painting over once you've varnished because you're, now your project is protected, but you still have some matte grab to it. So it actually feels like it's an unfinished surface and that's excellent for antique looking or aged things. 
but it's also great if you want to protect your surface and then go back and paint because it's not slippery at all. Okay, what I have here is a collection of pattern stencils. Best way and most um, nicely sized. This is a perfect size for most of our painting projects. We don't tend to paint over, you know, 16 inches or whatever. So this can be repeated a couple times, but it, it's not too repetitious if you know what I'm talking about. And so then we've got all the different standard shapes, polka dots, checks, diamonds, stars, all these things. And they can all fit together on, well, I took it apart, on our little metal clip. Um, and they're all designed to go together. So just a really neat way to keep all of your patterns together so that you can find them, you can put them in the right order and sequence. Um, for video, I have to take mine apart, so I don't get the luxury of storing them that way until I clean up my table. Okay, Dimensional Effects is a paintable texture paste. And what's kind of neat about this, it's nice and fluffy, first of all, which I adore. You can do this one of two ways. You can put it on clear, so you can just be like, wipe it through your stencil. Okay. And then that'll dry clear, and then you can paint over the top of it. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like. So it's nice and chunky and square. Love it. Or you can take some paint and you can mix it in. So say you've got this painted dark purple and you want some lighter purple um, diamonds to show. You could glitter this right after you do it. You could put um, textures in it. You could do any kind of neat thing you can think of afterwards. And that is just a really neat way to get an extra texture effect um, instead of always having flat paint. Okay, I showed you spattering earlier, but if you dampen your area, now I'm on paper, so I'm going to have to move really quick and spatter as if, like maybe you wanted some soft snow. Notice what happens to the spatters. They, they foam and spread out. So they look like they are just dreamy and awesome. So that's a really great way to get snow if you had a dark surface and you wanted it to look like it was magical and all that kind of stuff, then you just pre-wet it, then spatter it, and you'll end up with this gorgeous, glorious, spread out little awesomeness. And that tip was from Geraldine, sir. Okay, you can take Tack It Over and Over and you can put it on the back of your window clings. That sounds really silly, but sometimes we want our window clings to cling to things that they shouldn't cling to. Tack It is like a big poster uh, post-it note medium. It will stick to fabric. It will stick to everything. Don't put it on paper because it'll stick to paper forever. But um, you can use it to make many things stick. You can put it on the back of uh, maybe a little rock lawn painted pin and then you can just tack it to your clothing and it's a pin that doesn't need a hole, you know, or whatever. And that um, tip is by pa Paula Viggy. Okay, if you have sandpaper and you have an area that is just needing a lot of sanding, if you put double stick tape or even tack it over and over on your dowel or a brush or whatever, and you wrap your sandpaper around it, you'll make it into a sanding block and that will have extra super duper um, knocking back the wood capability. Um, if you're just using your fingertip pressure, that's got a kind of soft pad there. This makes it nice and firm so it will take all of the the, the raised areas away really quickly. So the tack it over and over is really great for the backs of stencils. It makes it like a big post-it note. But sometimes we want to use the back side or we don't want that tack it on there anymore. So a great tip sent in, let's see, who do we have? I think Dottie Cole um, sent that in. She says that if you put your um, stencil in the bottom of, you dissolve, sorry, we'll start over. Dissolve a um, dishwasher pack in your sink, stop it up and dissolve it, and then put your stencils in there. She says it takes the tacket and the paint right off and it's no problem. Okay, Geraldine Sir says that, you know, as you get older, sometimes your hands start shaking and all that. If you want to do really excellent line work, then she recommends not drinking tea or coffee first thing before you're going get, to um, get to your line work. And then she says if you eat a half a banana about a half hour ahead of time, it just seems to do the magic trick. So um, I thought those were excellent tips for um, you get that little bit of hand tremor thing going on. Okay, so if you're getting ready to paint something and you're going to make up your own colors, sometimes it's difficult to do that. You can use a computer program to do that. Um, you can use your chalk pencils to do that. 
crayons, anything like that. It's much easier just make a copy of this and then you can see, do I like this peach color next to this gray green or whatever. Instead of painting the project and getting it all base coated and taking your time, you can just do some casual coloring and then get a better idea of the colors that you want. Okay, there's a wonderful rule called the rule of two. In the rule of two, what it does, this is a value scale, and this is like your colors come in values. They um, come in darknesses, and what you do is you line up your color, and when you see it disappear against, and that's a little bit hard, you get in shine there. When you see it disappear when you squint your eyes, then you know that this is a value six. Okay, so you just run it up and down, find your value. Here's how this works. Generally speaking, in decorative painting, we seem to base coat in our middle values. Okay, and so then if you wanted to shade or highlight, you would go down by two. Okay, so that's that rule of two. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't highlight a value six with a value five because they're too close together and you're not going to have contrast. So you would jump down to a four and that's going to be the perfect level of contrast. So that's how you know, and then you could highlight further on your four with a two so that you could build that highlight, but you would need the four to support. So if your base coat is here and your four highlight is here, then you would two highlight here, so it graduates. Same thing works opposite for our shadow colors. We wouldn't shade with a seven, we'd shade up here at an eight. And it's very much like walking across a bridge. You could skip one board when you're walking across that, that bridge but it would be a big stretch to, to go over more than just the two steps. So that's a good rule to remember when you're trying to choose a shade or highlight color. Okay, this next tip is about selling your wares at, um, at trade shows. And what I, Sandy um, Tear sent me pictures of her booth because she just did a beautiful job. Not only does she have things out here on the, um, the tables, but she's gone up all the way up and used her upper real estate in all of this stuff. So she's got plenty of room to walk around, but she's got it set up so that she's not the main center of attention. She's over here, you know, way over on the side, taking the money and doing all that. Um, but there's plenty of room for more than one customer to get in there. She's used up all of her real estate. Remember when you rent a booth that's this big by this big, all of the space from the top to the bottom and all of the space in between is your real estate and you're spending, if you divide the cost, every bit you're not using is real estate money that you're not getting bang for the buck. I hope this um, image translates on the screen. And then let me show you. So this is a, a, another kind of close-up. Notice that she's got the big signage up here as well, so it's indicating to people what they're supposed to do. Just really neat, neat, neat. She's got lit up things. Um, you know, she's used these towers and wrapped ornaments around going up the towers. Very well done. Okay, this next tip is about palette shopping. Okay, and palette shopping is one of, like, it's such an easy way to, to get other color ideas. So here we've got Santa with a green bag and he's got, you know, this little purple um, thing you can take the color inspiration from this <coughs> and know that those are going to work in another application. So if you had a train you wanted to do, you could have there be green, red, and this blue color and it would work. <coughs> so here's the same kind of Santa, but now we're in this yellow green and they put a lot of gold in with this and stuff like that. And his red is almost orange. So this is a really neat way. Collect pictures that you really like put them in a color folder and then you can palette shop and be like, okay, yeah, I think I want to try a little bit of that. But notice, and you can also teach yourself a little bit about color theory. You notice over here in the back, you've got this little teddy bear with this little bit of blue bow. So blue and green and red seem to be definitely something that works together. So it's a good way to educate yourself as well. Okay, paper mache is a really neat, affordable surface but it can be like a little bit flexible and it's not eh, not so durable. Here's what I advise. When you're gonna do paper mache, what happens with paper when you seal it and do that kind of stuff is it gets a little bit thicker and heavier. So when I do my paper mache, I over treat the crud out of it. So I would go court sealer and I would do the whole thing a couple of times. I would do three base coats. I would varnish it twice, three times. And then my ultimate finish 
um, it would be that I would put some wax on it to keep it from chipping and that will make you feel like you have a much more substantial piece when you get it done. So just kind of over process it a little bit and it'll be beautiful for years to come. Did you know you can make a stencil? You don't just have to have stencils out of um, mylar. You can make a stencil on your Sizzik or your Cricut machine. Okay, so you can just use that vinyl and then you stick the vinyl done and then you peel it off. You can also trace your stencil pattern onto freezer paper, iron it on to your project and then, well, cut it out, then iron it on, paint the piece and then peel your, um, your paper off when it's dry. So you can use a couple of things to make um, stencils. This is a darling little pin that was painted for me when I taught a seminar in California a long time ago. And they've just stamped it and then colored it in and stuff like that and cut out the little bits. They've got little foam separators. But what I love about this is this is painted on cardstock, but it's, it's kind of hard. Um, I've had it for years. I you know take it out and wear it during season. And yeah, so that's 2009. Um, that's a long, long time. But what is neat about this same thing that works for the paper mache is that you can take your watercolor paper or your rock lawn or what have you and the more you treat it, the heavier it's going to get and it's going to act more wood-like. So you can take something very intricate, cut it out of paper, varnish it a couple of times and you're going to have a very durable piece. There's a really big trend um, in all kinds of gardening things and stuff. I, I, our garden days are coming for us, I think. They, um, we really just have, people are repurposing, I'm just lost in my conversation here, repurposing um, stones. This is, a, this is a rock from the garden. They're making ladybugs out of them. They're putting cute little bowling balls painted like ladybugs in the garden. They're just doing so many fun things with outdoor stuff and we have the paints and mediums to use with it. So it's really awesome. The way that you want to prep your outdoor stuff, especially things like bowling balls and rocks, um, stepping stones, is you want to clean them thoroughly with a nice brush. In the case of a bowling ball, you want to use a degreaser as well so that you get all the any stuff residues off of there. Once it's clean, you let it dry completely and then you're going to coat it. I would use a cork sealer and then you can base coat with your patio paints if it's going to live outside. And in this case, I based with a black and then I did my chalk effects over the top of it and then I can mist it and and I just have a nice paperweight or whatever, you know, what have you. But it's real easy to make real whimsical things out of simple things like rocks. You know, why not get the kids painting some things like this um, for parents and gifts and things like that? Okay, so we've talked about modeling paste and we've talked about stencils. Um, but you know, you can make some pretty darn cool backgrounds using stencils. And it doesn't take a lot of work and it's really a neat way of making, oh, I guess, you know, just taking something that wasn't there and creating something, you know, totally unique with it. So you can take your background stencil and just by rubbing over the top, so you could put modeling paste through it or whatever, but just by rubbing over the top, we have this hint of something. You could put a little modeling paste and then you could do a little bit of dry rubbing. You could put some um, texture glass through it. You can do so many things. So all over word stencils and all over um, pattern stencils like this brocade are amazing to use. Um, don't forget you can mix and match. There's lots and lots of all the variations in the world. Okay, the final and 100 or 300, if you go back to the all 100 versions of tips and tricks is how to prep your tin. So I've got a piece of tin from Della and Company and I've got a plate that was painted by my friend Mary Jo Gross and this is a tray that she painted as a Jo Sonia design. Okay, so the way you're going to prep your tin, this is going to have some oils and things on it from the manufacturer because that's how they keep it from being wrecked when it's in shipping containers and stuff. So what you'll do is you wash it in an acid bath, which is vinegar and water, and then you let it completely dry. You can put it in the oven, you can put it out in the hot sun. After it's completely, completely dry, then you can spray it with Krylon's um, light gray or a metal uh, car primer. Okay, so if you find a car primer that's cheaper, I think Walmart has a brand that's really cheap. Anyway, and then you bake that out in the hot sun or put it in a car that's going to sit around in a hot garage, anything like that. And after it's the older and the more baked it is, the better it is. Okay, so that's definitely something you want to pay attention to. 
And I've taken um, class pieces and I've baked them in my oven um, that I've had to prep like 70 tins for class. And so we've done it where we've sprayed them outside and then once they dried, I've brought them in and just stuffed them in the oven over and over and over again. So, um, and then when you finish tin, you always want to finish it with wax to keep it from chipping because tin always wants to chip and the wax prevents it completely from chipping.